Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about a class of functions called piecewise functions. Let's go over the main concept here. Suppose that I'm going to a restaurant that has two separate menus based on what time I'm actually trying to eat there. I'm going to have a breakfast menu and a regular menu. Now the breakfast menu is only offered between 7 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. and then the regular menu is offered for the rest of the day starting at 10.30 a.m. and ending at 11 p.m. So let's try to translate this concept into a function. The idea is our time, or the time of day that we enter the restaurant, will be our input to the function, and then the output will be whatever menu we get based on what time we entered. So out of this, we can develop what is called a piecewise function. We're going to let m of t represent this function, where t represents our time and m stands for menu. So the idea, again, is that I input a time to this function and I output a menu, either a breakfast menu or a regular menu. Now remember, this function is conditional. So the menu we get solely depends on what time we entered. So a way to write this function looks like this. I'll use a large curly brace, and I'll say that I get a breakfast menu if my time t is between 7 a.m. and 10.30 a.m., and I get a regular menu if my time is between 10.30 a.m. and 11 p.m. Notice that if t is equal to 10.30 exactly, I get a breakfast menu, but I do not get a regular menu because these time conditions cannot overlap. I know this notation can look a little busy, but the idea is that I have different situations or different possible outcomes for this function, those outcomes being my menus, so I just write all of my possible outcomes in a list, and then next to that item, or that outcome, I will write which situation gets me that outcome. So saying this more mathematically, since my menus are my outputs, and my inputs are my conditions on my time, I'll write it out in this kind of list in this order. In essence, this is exactly how a piecewise function will look. I've broken my function into different pieces based on the different outcomes. Let's try looking at something a little bit more mathematical. Suppose that I'm going to take two separate functions that I'm going to draw on the plane like this, where I have y equals x squared and y equals x minus 2, and I'm going to try to stitch these functions together based on different situations. I'm going to keep referring to the time analogy because I think that's the one that sticks the best. Basically, I'm going to say that on a certain time, or a certain portion of the number line, I want to consider y equals x squared, but on a completely different segment of the number line, I want to consider y equals x minus 2. So imagine that I'm dividing the number line into multiple components, and I'm only considering each of these functions within their assigned part of the number line. To be more concrete, suppose that I only want to consider the function y equals x squared when x is less than or equal to 1, and then I only want to consider x minus 2 when x is strictly greater than 1. So in this situation, positive 1 is sort of like my benchmark. I'm going to cut the number line into two halves, and on one half, I'm going to consider y equals x squared, and on the other half, I'm going to consider y equals x minus 2. So only when x is less than or equal to negative 1, I consider y equals x squared, so I'm going to erase that half of the graph that I don't need. And when considering y equals x minus 2, I only consider it when x is strictly greater than 1, so I erase the non-needed half of that graph as well. Since for y equals x squared, I'm allowing x to be equal to 1, I'll draw a closed filled-in circle on the portion of the graph that didn't get erased, and I'll draw an open circle on y equals x minus 2, because there, x is supposed to be strictly greater than 1, but not equal to 1. So again, all I've said is that on portions of the number line, I consider one function, but not the other. So I erase the half of the graph that isn't considered on that part of the x-axis. So now that I have what this looks like on the graph, I can go ahead and start writing it as an explicit formula. This is going to look very similar to the previous slide where I had the menu function. I'm going to have all of my possible outcomes on the left and all of my conditions on the right. I'll start by calling this function f of x, and I'll open a large left curly bracket where I'm going to input all of my information. So I know that when x is less than or equal to negative 1, I should get y equals to x squared, so I'm going to go ahead and write that in this curly brace. This reads f of x equals to x squared if x is less than or equal to 1. To finish off, I have to put in the information for x minus 2. So I'll write that as f of x equals to x minus 2 if x is greater than 1. So this is how you write and graph the piecewise function that takes on x squared when x is less than or equal to 1, and that takes on x minus 2 if x is greater than 1. We've got a formula, 
and we've got a graph. So even though the notation does look a little crazy, this is the same thing as the menu problem. We have our possible outcomes based on possible x values. Let's talk about how to evaluate piecewise functions at given points. We'll evaluate the points f of negative 2 and f of positive 12. The way to evaluate piecewise functions is to look at the input and try to figure out which situation it goes into. Looking at f of negative 2, we know that negative 2 is less than or equal to 1, so we'll take on x squared. Therefore, f evaluated at negative 2 comes out to negative 2 squared, which is 4. For the next one, we know that 12 is greater than 1, so we'll take on x minus 2, giving us that f of 12 equals to 12 minus 2, which equals to 10. So again, evaluating piecewise functions at points means that you need to look at your input, then figure out which situation you fit, and then figure out the corresponding function that goes with that. Let's get a little more practice with looking at a graph and writing it as an explicit function. Consider this graph, where the blue function is represented by y equals quantity x minus 4 squared plus 4, the orange line is the constant function y equals 2, and the purple line is the linear function y equals to 2x minus 3. I'm going to note this function by f of x just like I did last time and start by opening a large left open curly bracket. When looking at a graph and then trying to come up with an explicit formula, the best thing to do is to read from left to right on the graph and then encode this information in your piecewise function by working your way down. Think of it like reading from left to right and then building your function from top to bottom. Before we jump in, let's study this for a second. We see that the blue function, y equals quantity x minus 4 squared plus 4, has an open circle where it ends. And this function appears to be ending at the x value, negative 3. This tells us that I get the function 4 minus x squared plus 4 when my x value is less than negative 3. So I write that into my piecewise function, like so. 4 minus x squared plus 4 if x is strictly less than negative 3. Again, x is strictly less than negative 3 because I have an open circle in my graph. Looking at the orange function, y equals 2, we see that this function takes place on the number line between negative 3 and positive 1. This is where I have a closed circle above negative 3 and an open circle above positive 1. So I write that in my piecewise function as 2 if negative 3 is less than or equal to x is strictly less than 1. For the last piece, I see that if x is strictly greater than 1, I get the purple function, which is 2x minus 3. Therefore, I write that in my piecewise function as 2x minus 3 if x is strictly greater than 1. I'll emphasize this again, x is strictly greater than 1 because I have an open circle at the endpoint of the purple function. And that's how you write the piecewise function for this graph. Now at this point, we can start asking some more specific questions about the graph. The first question we'll ask is, if the point 0, 2 is actually a point on this function. And the way to do that is to plug in 0 into this piecewise function and then look at our output. If our output is equal to 2, then the point 0, 2 is a point of this graph. But if our output is something different, then the point 0, 2 is not a point of this graph. So when evaluating 0, we need to see which situation 0 fits into. The only situation we can see is that 0 is between negative 3 and positive 1, so the function will take on the value 2. And this tells us that 0, 2 is a point in our graph. Next, let's ask if the point 2, 2 is a point in our graph. The input 2 fits the situation x greater than 1, so we're going to look at the bottom function, 2x minus 3. But we notice that 2x minus 3 evaluated at 2 gives us the point 1 and not 2. So that tells us that the point 2, 2 is not a point in our graph. The last interesting thing to note about this function is that at the point positive 1 on the x-axis, I have open circles both above and below. What that actually means is that negative 1 doesn't fit any of the situations listed in my piecewise function. So that tells you that f of 1 is actually not defined. This sometimes happens in piecewise functions just because these can come up with a lot of gaps and a lot of empty spaces. And when that happens, it doesn't mean that you wrote, recorded your function wrong, it just means that the function is not defined there. In our next example, we're given the piecewise function f of x is equal to x plus 1 squared if x is less than or equal to negative 1, 
or f of x is equal to 3 to the x if x is greater than or equal to 0. Drawing this on the graph, we get pictures that look like this. I have the parabola stopping at negative 1, and I have my exponential function starting at x equals 0. Noticing that I have a gap in the middle, we'll later talk about how to actually identify how big these gaps are and how to actually describe them. But just by looking at the graph here, you should be able to convince yourself that there is a large portion of the number line in which the function is not defined. The first question we'll answer about this is, does this piecewise function have any x-intercepts? In other words, does f of x ever take on the value 0? Visually, we can see that the blue curve on the left is touching the x-axis, so that does lead us to believe that it is possible to take on the value 0. It looks like the blue curve, x plus 1 squared, is touching the x-axis at the point x equals to negative 1. But we can certainly test that to be sure. Let's input negative 1 into our piecewise function, and we find that x plus 1 squared does in fact equal 0 when x is equal to negative 1. And we also notice that x to the third never equals to 0 in this particular context, which you can tell just by reading off the graph. So we find that f of negative 1 equaling to 0 is our only x-intercept, and that point looks like negative 1, 0, and we're done. Remember that whenever you're asked to find an x-intercept, you're trying to find where your function ever takes on the value 0 as an output, or rather, where you're crossing the x-axis. Next, we'll search for y-intercepts. Now remember that a y-intercept is looking for f evaluated at 0, and with piecewise functions, we need to be careful on whether or not such a thing is defined. So, let's look at 0 as input. We see that this does fit the situation, x being greater than or equal to 0, and we notice that f of 0 then equals 3 to the 0, which is defined to be 1. Therefore, the point 0, 1 is our only y-intercept, which again you can see by reading off the graph. Now let's address the gap in this function. The best way to say that is where is this function undefined? I can go ahead and shade this in on our graph, but let's be a little bit more explicit. I'm going to map out my x-axis as a number line and put all of my information here. I know that my function is defined when x is less than or equal to negative 1 and when x is greater than or equal to 0, but I've got this hole in the middle which turns out to be negative 1 less than x less than 0. So I can draw a horizontal purple line and make open circles around those endpoints. Translating this into interval notation looks like the interval open on both ends from negative 1 to 0. Therefore, I find that f is undefined on the open interval from negative 1 to 0. So often when presented with a piecewise function, you'll be asked questions like this. Where is it undefined? Does it have x-intercepts or does it have y-intercepts? This is basically how you tackle that. Often drawing the function is very helpful. For our last example, and this one will be a little bit easier, we're going to be given a picture of a piecewise function and asked to evaluate the function f at certain points. So our function is going to look like this, where I have dotted lines there to help us try to pinpoint which x or y value it's corresponding to. Our goal is to compute f of negative 2, f of 0, f of 1, and f of 3. Really this just means finding that particular input value on the x-axis and tracing where you're located in terms of the graph on your y-axis. So looking at negative 2, we drop down to see that we get a value of negative 2 as output. Looking at 0, we have a dot at 0, so we get an output of 0. At negative 1, we trace downward because we see a closed circle, so we get an output value of negative 2. And then at f of 3, we find that we're actually undefined because I have an open circle around 3, which means that there's nothing to be done there. And that's how you evaluate a function looking at the picture.